It's computers that make us notice that the 20th century is the digital century, that lead us to spot the digital in genetics, in neurobiology. And I, I believe, although here I lack the confidence of knowledge in physics, for I think it can be argued that quantum theory, that part of physics which is most dis uh, distinctive of the 20th century, quantum theory is telling us that the very fabric of reality itself is fundamentally digital. The experimental predictions of quantum theory are upheld to the tenth place of decimals. Any theory with such a spectacular grasp on reality commands our respect. But whether we conclude that reality itself is grainy or that this digital discontinuity is forced upon an underlying deep continuity only when we try to measure it, I don't know, and physicists present will sense that the matter is too deep for me. I hope it's not necessary for me to add that this deficiency gives me no satisfaction. Sadly, there are literary and journalistic circles in which ignorance or incomprehension of science is boasted with pride and even glee. If I have difficulties with quantum theory, and I do, it's not for want of trying, and certainly not a source of pride. I endorse the view of Steven Pinker and the evolutionary psychologists that Darwinian natural selection has designed our brains to understand the slow dynamics of large objects on the African savannas, as Douglas Adams has just been conveying to us so beautifully. Perhaps somebody, perhaps even Douglas, should devise a computer game in which bats and balls and objects behave according to a an illusion on the screen of quantum dynamics. And children brought up with such games might find modern physics no more impenetrable than we find the concept of stalking a mammoth. Personal uncertainty about the uncertainty principle reminds me of another hallmark that will be alleged for 20th century science. It will be claimed that this is the century in which the deterministic confidence of the previous century was shattered, partly by quantum theory, partly by chaos theory, in the trendy, not the ordinary language meaning, and partly by cultural relativism. Quantum uncertainty and chaos theory have had deplorable effects upon popular culture, much to the annoyance of genuine aficionados. Both are regularly exploited by obscurantists, ranging from professional quacks to daffy new agers. In America, the self-help healing industry coined millions, and it has not been slow to cash in on quantum theory's formidable talent to bewilder. One well-heeled healer has written a string of best-selling books on what he calls quantum healing. Another book in my possession has sections on quantum psychology, quantum responsibility, quantum morality, quantum aesthetics, quantum immortality, and quantum theology. But quantum theory, whatever the indeterminacy at its heart, whatever the philosophical difficulties of its interpretation, is, as I said, spectacularly accurate in the experimental success of its prediction. The late Richard Feynman assessed this accuracy as equivalent to knowing the distance from New York to Los Angeles to an accuracy of the width of one human hair. So here is no license for anything goes intellectual flappers with their quantum theology and quantum caring and quantum you name it. Another threat comes from a new form of anti-scientific rhetoric, sometimes called the postmodern critique of science. And I recommend two recent books that have splendidly blown the whistle on this kind of thing. Paul Gross and Norman Levitt's Higher Superstition, and Alan Sokol and Jean Brickman's Intellectual Impostures, which masquerades under some other name in the American market. I've forgotten what it is. The 
American anthropologist Matt Cartmill has summed up the basic credo of the postmodern critique of science. Anybody who claims to have objective knowledge about anything is trying to control and dominate the rest of us. There are no objective facts. All supposed facts are contaminated by theories, and all theories are infested with moral and political doctrines. Therefore, when some guy in a lab coat tells you that such and such is an objective fact, he must have a political agenda up his starched white sleeve. And there's a feminist angle which saddens me, for I'm sympathetic to true feminism. I quote from Noretta Kurtke. Instead of exhorting young women to prepare for a variety of technical subjects by studying science, logic and mathematics, women studies students are now being taught that logic is a tool of domination. The standard norms and methods of scientific inquiry are sexist because they are incompatible with women's ways of knowing. The authors of the prize-winning book with this title report that the majority of the women they interviewed fell into the category of subjective knowers, characterized by a passionate rejection of science and scientists. These subjectivist women see the methods of logic, analysis, and abstraction as alien territory belonging to men, and value intuition as a safer and more fruitful approach to truth. There is an ugly, hectoring streak in this kind of thinking. Barbara Ehrenreich and Janet McIntosh describe uh, something they witnessed a woman psychologist speaking at an interdisciplinary conference. And after her talk, various members of the audience attacked her use of the, quote, oppressive, sexist, imperialist, and capitalist scientific method. This woman psychologist tried to defend science by pointing to its great discoveries, for example, DNA. And the retort came back, you believe in DNA? Fortunately, there are still many intelligent young women prepared to enter a scientific career, and I should like to pay tribute to their courage in the face of such bullying intimidation.